particularly. Um, Jane Rigby, our speaker this evening, is a Spitzer Space Telescope postdoctoral fellow at the Carnegie Observatories. For those of you who aren't familiar with Spitzer, it's a sister satellite to the Hubble, but it works in the mid-infrared, that is far to the red of the optical spectrum, it essentially measures heat radiation. And Jane is an expert on Spitzer. She received uh, dual undergraduate degrees, one in physics and one in astronomy and astrophysics from Penn State University, and then went on to get her PhD at the University of Arizona. As a graduate student and also a postdoc at the University of Arizona, she was a member of a, a team that used the Spitzer Telescope, in fact, um, uh, an instrument, an imaging instrument that worked in, in the far infrared, and for which she became an expert. Her own research interests are centered on uh, understanding star formation in galaxies, and particularly very luminous galaxies that uh, are evolving over the course of the lifetime of the universe. And also the centers of galaxies where there are black holes and a lot of activity, sometimes extremely obscured by dust that surrounds them, and that can only be studied um, in detail using these mid-infrared long wavelengths. She's currently, uh, she's got a project which is a very novel technique to essentially use the universe as her telescope. Um, Albert Einstein had predicted that uh, very massive galaxies would bend the light that's coming from other galaxies which happens to pass through something like a distant cluster, a massive object, cause that light to bend. And it's the ultimate telescope. Um, uh, using a massive cluster to amplify the light of um, distant objects behind it. And, and Jane has started a project to um, measure the properties of these galaxies that would never be able to be observed otherwise, except that the, the universe itself focuses the light, essentially, as a telescope and allows you to see very faint objects. I had the pleasure of working with Jane also. She has joined me and also Barry Medore, who many of you know in this audience, uh, for a large new project using Spitzer to measure the age of the universe to unprecedented precision. And we'll begin uh, obtaining our data from Spitzer this June, and it's a two-year project that I'm sure will keep us busy for the next decade. <laughs> um, so given uh, Jane's expertise, I think uh, she's an ideal person to talk to us tonight. I think she um, had the, her access to the entire electromagnetic spectrum uh, the ability of her to uh, see new distant stars that are forming, study black holes, and many other objects that are a range of wavelengths. And uh, I'm told she has some surprises for us tonight. So please help me welcome Dr. Jane Rigby. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm doing my Lauren McCall imitation tonight. I have a little bit of laryngitis, so bear with me. I have an entire Walgreens down here. I got cough drops, I got lemons, so I'm actually fine. Let's just go ahead and pretend I always talk like this, okay? So it's a pleasure to be here. Um, when I was thinking about what to talk about tonight, I really wanted to talk first about light and the nature of light and why that's so important to astronomers, because it's what we can learn, it's how we can learn about the universe. And I'll, I'll talk about how the history of astronomy has really been about overcoming our tiny little eyeballs that you know are nice, but are not really what you need to study the universe the way we do now. And how much richer and more beautiful, and also how more scientifically productive the universe is when we can see it in all of its colors and how that's the history of the modern universe has been learning how to do, uh, the modern astronomy has been learning how to do that. Um, and because everyone loves black holes, and when I give talks, public talks, and black holes are at the end, everyone asks 45 minutes of questions about black holes. So obviously people want more of the black holes. So there's a bunch of them in here, okay? And then baby stars and, and hot stars are kind of tacked on at the end, and if you want to know more, maybe everyone will ask 20 minutes questions about that. That'd be great. Um, but I'll talk about how when we have access to the full range of light that exists in the universe, we, that's a much better way to try to find black holes. So as I said, the history of modern astronomy is about overcoming our small, limited, albeit very cute, eyeballs. All right? They're great, but they're just not very big. 
they're about six millimeters across. And most, but when you look back at the history of astronomy, and every culture invented astronomy, this was a long history, but almost all of the history of astronomy has been about eyeballs, all right? So if we look at the Babylonian astronomers, some of the very earliest, the reason that we have 360 degrees takes you all around, right? Eyeballs. When we look at Hipparchus of Rhodes, about 130 BC, he was using eyeballs and some devices to measure angles. We look at Mayan astronomy, with these uh, very complicated calendars, eyeballs. And we look at the Anasazi um, in New Mexico, um, who were really meticulous at predicting eclipses um, and other phenomena far beyond what you need to farm. They just thought it was neat. Eyeballs. And so most of the history, going back a couple thousand years of astronomy, is about eyeballs and devices to measure how far apart stars are. And you know, that got people pretty far. Uh, the ability, um, Arnie, can you give me a little more mic? Um, the ability to predict eclipses, to describe how the planets were moving, to discover precession. So, you know, I'm not making fun of eyeballs. They got us most of the way we are in the modern universe. And as we look back, we can get to the last ancient style astronomer, the Dane, Tycho Brahe. I'm told that's pronounced Tycho Brahe, but that just sounds like gargling. Um, in the late 1500s. And as you can see, Tycho was pretty big on devices to measure angles, huge ones, um, in his planetarium, in his castle. And that was good enough data to force Kepler, his protege, to conclude against his will that the sun was not the center of everything, that the sun was the center of everything. But still, eyeballs and very intricate angle measuring devices. And then, 400 years ago, plus one, comes the invention of the telescope uh, by the Dutch in 1608. And Galileo turns it heavenward in 1609. And so this year, is the 400th anniversary of that, um, the International Year of Astronomy. And so, you know, this, a lot of special events all around the world dedicated to uh, this being the anniversary of the telescope. Now this is a replica of one of Galileo's telescopes. The originals, they're pictures, but they're even worse to look at. It's hard to see what they were. Um, but they were very crude. They were leather, little tiny eyepieces in here. And they gathered about 10, he made a succession of them, and then tried to market them and make money off of them. He gathered between 10 times more light than an eyeball to about 100 for his biggest. So still, that's a pretty big improvement, enough to see, and then some magnification. Um, to see that Jupiter had moons that orbited it, um, to see sunspots. For comparison, our Magellan telescopes in Chile, which is where I picked up this cold. Um, <laughs> it's not swine flu, don't worry. Um, these telescopes gather about a million times more light than an eyeball. All right? So it would be criminal to put an eyeball you know, in the eyepiece, although we do that once in a while, it's really neat. Most of the time we put million dollar cameras that can detect 80 to 90% of all the light that hits them um, and use those to record all the light. Your eyeball doesn't do any better than a couple percent, so you'd be losing 90% of the light. Um, and so the history of astronomy, in part, and the reason the telescopes and that Galileo's use for astronomy of the already invented telescope was so key is that it gathered way more light than an eyeball can. In Magellan's case, about a million times. The other revolution, and this is one that's happened in you know, the lifetimes of most of the people in this room, um, since the 80s, um, and then for other technologies a little further back, we have the ability to detect light, to build artificial eyeballs, to build detectors that can detect light that our eyes can't see. And this is a, um, these are actually CCDs like what are in your digital cameras. So you can see that light, it's, it detects optical light, but these get 90% of all the pieces of light that hit them, they're very, very efficient. And then also in parallel has been the development of detectors that detect light that your eyeball can't see. We'll talk more about that later in the talk. But I'd like to back up for a minute and ask the more basic question, why are we so focused on light? Why do astronomers spend so much of their time worried about detecting light? What kind of light? Um, what's the right instrument to measure the light? Well, astronomy, unfortunately, is an observational science. It's not an experimental science, right? Biochemistry is an experimental science. You change a gene in a rat, and you see what happens. Astronomy can't do that. I can't change a black hole and see what happens. 
I have to try to find a bunch of black holes that I think are doing one thing and then some that are doing another and compare them. So in that way, it's like anthropology. Uh, it's like geology. You are stuck with what the universe gives you and you have to try to make observations and figure out what's going on. And we're stuck on Earth. All the fun stuff's happening out in the universe and we're stuck here. And so we have to wait for things to come to us. And so let's back up and ask what messengers come to us. Well, the first, which you probably may not have heard of, are these things. Little pieces of other people's solar systems. This is a piece of silicon carbide, a little piece of dust. It's very hard. It's made into drills, not the ones that came from space, just regular ones. Um, and this blew in on the solar wind before our solar system had formed, and then got incorporated in uh, part of the asteroid belt, and then fell to Earth as a meteorite. And so this is a little piece of what the solar system, of what other people's solar systems looked like before ours formed. So that's pretty neat. And asteroids in general tell us what the solar system looked like very early ago. So that's one piece. Um, another are particles, massive particles, like neutrinos, like cosmic rays, that are moving at almost the speed of light and come slamming down to Earth. Now, these are really important, and millions of dollars have been spent detecting these. To date, there are two sources, astronomical sources, of neutrinos. There's the sun, and there's the supernova 1987a. So that's great, but if you have a sky with two objects in it, it's not a lot to look at, you know? You can trade back and forth. Um, and so these are important, and there are detectors being built and that are working now to detect these high-energy cosmic rays. But they're kind of, you know, on the periphery. They're important, but they're not the bulk of what astronomers are doing. Um, and you're getting very few particles from supernova 1987a. There's just a few little neutrinos. There's also this experiment called LIGO to detect gravity waves. That is, to detect the distortions of space-time as uh, neutron stars collide together. They haven't done it yet. It's technologically a really hard thing. You're de trying to detect space moving and bending just a little bit, and you have things like the ocean and trucks driving by and all of these things that get in the way. So that's important, and it's a very interesting thing because it's, a, it's a, predict a basic prediction of, of Einstein's theories. Um, but we aren't yet seeing the universe in gravity waves. Maybe further along in our lives, we would be able to do that. And so these things are all important. But 99% of what we know about the universe is coming from light, normal old light. And so I want to get to this important point, which is if you want to know about the universe, you would better really know light, because light is the way you will find out almost everything about the place where we live. So it's worth taking a moment and asking, fundamentally, um, what is light? Well, I mean, that can seem like kind of a dumb question. We know what light is. It's sunny days, it's rainbows, it's that flickering fluorescent in your office that never goes off, you know? But the, the question, what is light, is actually a really profound question that gets at the, the, history, the, that gets at the heart of a lot of 20th century physics and a whole bunch of Nobel Prizes. Light is quantum mechanical. That means that it is both a particle and a wave. It consists of little particles called photons, which don't have any mass. So they travel at the speed of light, the fastest anything, anything can. But in some ways, they have wave-like properties. Uh, and if you ask any questions, I don't think this laser is powerful enough, but we can just try to demonstrate it for you, um, that that has to be true. So light is both a particle and a wave. It's carried in these little photons. And they don't have any mass, and yet they're able to carry energy. Now, okay, photons can carry energy. Light can carry energy. We all know that, all right? Anyone who's light-skinned has been painfully aware that light carries energy. En enough energy, if you're not careful, to burn skin. And this is, of course, why people worry about ultraviolet photons, because they can not only make for a very uncomfortable day, and I don't know why this poor man put this photo of himself on the internet, but he didn't. <laughs> um, or with prolonged exposure, not only to burn your skin, but to change your DNA, to break bonds, molecular bonds in your DNA, which is, of course, where skin cancer comes from. Now, UV photons will burn your skin. We all know that. We wear sunscreen, okay. But the photons that are coming at me right now, the light from this, uh, um, from the, from, um, this spotlight, is never going to give me any sort of sunburn. 
Okay? Why? How come sunlight is dangerous, UV photons are dangerous, and this isn't? Okay? Well, the answer is the amount of energy that is carried by every single photon, every piece of light. Okay? UV photons carry a lot of energy, and photons like this, um, light from the, the spotlight generally doesn't. Easy way to think about that, right? A falling bowling ball and 100 tennis balls can easily carry the same amount of energy, but you can certainly tell the difference. <laughs> and so, you know, think about this as the UV photon, it carry, or an X-ray photon. This is why your lab tech leaves the room when you get an X-ray. Right? Because those photons carry enough energy in them to change the bonds in your DNA. IR photons, or optical photons, you can add up a whole bunch of them, but they don't, you know, they, they can make you feel warm, but none of them has enough energy to break a bond. They don't, you, they don't work together. Okay? There's some minimum energy that's required to break a piece of your DNA apart. And all the photons that I might sit here all day aren't going to add up to do that. Does that make sense? So what matters is both the intensity of the light and how much energy each little photon carries. And so, you know, the rainbow that we're all familiar with is just sunlight spread out by the energy carried by each photon. And so we have photons with not much energy here in the red will never burn you, and then in the blue, not quite enough to burn you. And as we all know, the rainbow is not all there is. There's more out there that you can't see. There's light off on this side too blue for you to see, and light that's too red for you to see. Um, your cats, I'm told, can see this red. That's why they're supposed to not jump on hot stoves. It's not clear to me this is true. <laughs> These blue photons, bees can see. Bees love white flowers because they look very, they love blue flowers, very white and shiny. And so there are animals on Earth that can see more of the red or more of the blue than we can. And so actually there's a whole lot of light, more than what we can see. This is just a tiny sliver, the optical, the visible, of the photons that you and I have eyeballs that can see, which is the light that the sun makes, right? We're all set up to see reflected light from the sun. But this means we're no good at seeing ultraviolet radiation, and so we don't know that we're burned until it's too late. We're not any good at seeing infrared radiation, although I'll show you there are ways around that. Um, and there are, you know, all of this whole sequence, things that we normally talk about in a very different context. I went to get some, I went to get an x-ray. Um, you gotta wear sunscreen or you'll get, you know, you'll get skin cancer from the UV. I'm gonna microwave my dinner. I'm listening to KPCC, right? This is all the same thing. It's just light of different energies. And so for an astronomer, an astronomer is a very greedy person. They look at this and say, why would I observe the universe, just this little slender bit of it, when I can use all the colors, right? There must be more information than what I can see with my little eyeballs. There's also another connection between the color of light on this, as we spread out and call we can just talk about the amount of energy carried by, its, by each photon as a color. It's easier to talk about. Um, but there's another reason that there's another connection between the energy carried by each photon, the color of the light, and astronomy. And so these are two things to remember. Anything with a temperature makes light, and the temperature determines the color of that light. This is another one of those things that sounds really simple, yeah, yeah anything with a temperature makes light, but it's really profound. Notice that the, you know, the, the state of the material doesn't matter, whether it's a solid, whether it's a liquid, whether it's a gas. It doesn't matter how dense the material is or how squishy it is. What matters is its temperature, and that's going to tell you its characteristic color. And so just looking out of the universe, we can see that these blue stars are really hot, much hotter than the sun, yellow star, which is much hotter than cool red stars, red dwarfs, um, Jupiter, if it weren't shining. Um, from, in reflected light from the sun, it also um, emits cool light itself. And even lava, right? We know that lava is cooler than these blue stars because it's red, it's down in low energy per photon. And so there's this fundamental connection between the color of the light that you see coming in from the universe and how hot that astronomical body is, which at least tells you something about what it is. Um, this is saying the same thing in a more technical way, just taking four, uh, four stars of different temperatures. 
from something that's a little cooler than the sun, something that's a little hotter than the sun, something that's much cooler than the sun, and something that's human temperature. Kelvin is degrees above absolute zero. So you just take 273 and add it to two degrees Celsius. Anyway, I'm 300 K, so are you. OK. Um, <laughs> this will become important in a second. And so you can see that the sun, which we know emits yellow light mostly, that's its characteristic color, is kind of right between these guys. It's about 6,000 K. So it's emitting both mostly it peaks in the yellow. Whereas this star, which is hotter, is more in the blue. The star, which is cooler, is more in the red, and even red, redder than you can see. This star, which is very cool, is putting out hardly any light in the optical. If you want to see it, you need to look at things that are cooler than red. And for this guy, which is me, right, you can see this goes all the way down. So if you would like to turn out the house lights and wait for me to start glowing in light that you can see, we're going to wait a while. Right? We're just too cool. Oh, that was a nice transition. Marty. So as light, as, so let's go back to lava, right? Lava is about the temperature of the coolest stars that we can detect. And so as lava cools, right, we go from the hot stuff, which is yellow, to this reddish color, which is cooler, and then we start cooling enough that it goes kind of that dull, dull red like a stove, and then we can't see it anymore. But it's still giving off light. It's giving off infrared light. Now, what about you? We, are, we all have a temperature, and what did we say? Anything with a temperature makes light. So, okay, we are making light, we make infrared light. Normally when we look at each other, we look at reflected light off the sun, off lamps. But now we're going to look at each other in direct light, the light that we all make, the infrared light that we glow. And your eyeballs can't do this, so we're going to go use a different set of eyeballs. We're going to use an infrared detector that is designed to look at this uh, long wavelength, low energy infrared photons. So, there we go. That's a little better. So the house lights are off, and this is a trickery, right? I know I'm doing a little kind of magician stuff, but this is all real. Um, it it freezes for a second, ignore it. Um, this is the light that I'm just glowing. And it, it kind of uh, has some ghosts, so I'm moving around a little bit. But this is me glowing, okay? I'm at about 300 Kelvin body temperature, and I'm emitting infrared radiation, which is nice because a lot of things in the universe we'd like to study, like cool stars, like stars that are still forming, um, like galaxies that are very dusty, are all about this temperature. All right, so this isn't a trick. We can, Eva, could you pan to the front row? I know these people would love their picture taken. Um, all right, it's no trick. You guys are all glowing. You're all making light because you have a temperature, okay? So hi, everybody. <laughs> Yay! Okay. Your portrait. My ghost is still there. It's great. All right. So this camera, which costs about 4,000 bucks, and you can buy one on eBay if you want one. <laughs> We're being very careful with it tonight. It's borrowed. Um, this camera detects photons at 10 microns, which is about 20 times lower energy per photon than your eyeball can detect. Okay, this is the mid-infrared that Wendy was talking about earlier. It's actually a wavelength that's very useful in astronomy, and I'll show you pictures later on. They were taken by much more sophisticated cameras that don't cost $4,000 on eBay um, of astronomical objects. So let's go up. Um, Eva, if you could just point up. This is Eva Mongshev I was doing. Voluntary, thank you so much. Uh, if we go up to the house lights, the house lights are off, and they've been off for a couple of minutes. And so, you know, you can all see that they're not blowing in the optical, but they're still putting off the healthy amount of glow in the red as we cool them out. You may need a reset. And so, I told you I was feeling so well, so let me get a nice swig of cold water. <coughs> to glow very well in the wavelengths this camera can see. I would need a longer wavelength camera. Okay, back to the hot tea. Extra lemon and ginger. I think that's, that's really work. Okay, stupid tricks, right? So, there we go. Now, everyone has the 
the notion, and it's partly right, it's kind of right, it's kind of wrong, that the infrared is somehow special in ghosting, that it sees heat. But every photon carries heat, right? Because everything with a temperature emits light, that also is cooling us. Because we're glowing in the infrared, this is why you need to eat, because you're all losing energy. And if you didn't, you'd cool down and wouldn't be alive anymore, right? So everything with a temperature gives off light. And so all kinds of light are things that are glowing. Except, actually, ask me, it's a good question. There's a lot of ways to make life in the, light in the universe that don't work this way. This is one way to make light. Um, and this, these are kind of dumb tricks, but they're getting across the point, I hope. <coughs> that different kinds of light can tell you things that the optical can't, right? I think it's pretty obvious which one of these has hot liquid and which has cold, right? Okay, good. Um, and if we can have one or two brave people in the front row stand who are willing and able, if you could just move forward a couple feet. Can we see your chairs? How much this is going to work? Ah. You want to reset it, Eva? Just, or just, yeah, I feel it. Yeah, that's a rough temperature. Oh, so that one isn't going to work. Oh, well. I got a better one. This one, which is actually really important. You sit down. Thanks. Um, this one is actually really important for, the, for astronomy. Can I get a little bit of house lights, Army? Or just the podium light? All right. As we use different kinds of light, we see that materials that we're used to and that we're used to being clear are not always clear in other wavelengths of light. And vice versa, that things that are opaque and we can't see through in the optical may be quite visible. And so this is just a garden variety trash bag. glass to build your detectors because it won't work, but you can see through things that you can't in the optical. And, you know, should we be a little bit silly? Do you guys want a really stupid silly trick? Yeah! take home here. Um, and let me just review them so you don't just remember a smiley face, please. People are too cool to radiate in the optical, so we see each other in reflected light from other sources that are hotter. Um, but we do all glow in the infrared, and so do cool things in the universe like planets, like brown dwarfs, or places where new stars are in the process of forming are, ra are very cool, and so that's how we can see them. Um, and later on, I'll show you some examples like this. So let's switch projectors again. Fuck, oh, maybe running out here. There we go. That wasn't a trick. It's a B. So I hope I've convinced you that there's more light in the rainbow than you and I can see. And that this unseen light can tell us something useful. Um, I've shown you that it can tell you things about whether things are hot or cold and, and see through things you can't see. Let's go take a look at some things in the universe uh, where we'd really like to see further than we can with our eyeballs. Now, 
So when we're looking with very high energy photons, things like X-rays, like gamma rays, we're looking at either very hot things in the X-rays or other processes that aren't thermal. We'll talk about that later. Um, and so you know, the high energy universe is for looking at very hot, very energetic things. And then we have the cold universe that use things like this camera, dust that are cold like planets. And then we have things that are very dusty. Imagine a whole bunch of those trash bags piled together, right? The universe is a really dirty place. It has lots of soot. It has a lot of dust. And it's hard to see. And what's worse, new stars make a lot of dust. So it can, can be hard to see the things we'd really like to see, how stars are forming in galaxies and how galaxies build up their stars. So it's great that we now have, and this is a recent phenomenon, access to the whole electromagnetic spectrum to do our astronomy in. Everything from the gamma rays all the way down to the radio. But this is also a burden. It means that astronomers kind of have to work a lot harder. In 1917, Mount Wilson was built. The 100-inch telescope was built on Mount Wilson. It was the largest telescope in the world. And so you call it a day. We've done it, right? We built a telescope. What kind of light does it see? What do you mean what kind of light it can see? The only kind we use. And now we use a different telescope to detect and study each kind of light. And astronomers um, are increasingly multi-wavelength astronomers like me, where they're perfectly happy using the X-ray or the optical or the infrared or whatever they need to solve the problem. But this is a lot more work, right? Because you gotta use data from all of these different telescopes. And this is uh, wordy, but I just wanted to show you um, as we go all the way up from the gamma ray, very high energy photons, to x-ray, UV, optical, infrared, and then right down to the radio at low energies, that these things got their start doing, multi, doing astronomy very recently. The exception, the invention of the telescope, 1609, um, by, um, you know, okay, that was 400 years ago. But look at the rest of these, right? These are all very recent discoveries. The radio was discovered before the Second World War, but not much research was done until after the war when people had leftover radar, uh, radar sets. Uh, the infrared in the early 70s as military detectors became useful, and then astronomers built things even better than that. Uh, the ultraviolet, note most of the UV, you think that poor guy's sunscreen was bad, he should go into space, right? Most of the UV photons are blocked by our atmosphere. And so if you want to do UV astronomy, ultraviolet astronomy, you need to go into space. And that wasn't done until the 70s. Same for the x-rays, where they built sounding rockets, where you went up on a rocket, you had four minutes of data, and then it got down. So work quickly. Um, and then the submillimeter really got started even more recently and is still the least mature of these. And so we're at this stage now where we have decent instruments in all of these kinds of light. Uh, Fermi has just launched. Chandra has been up for 10 years. In the UV, Hubble actually goes into the UV, so does the probe called Galax. We all know and love Hubble. Spitzer is the Hubble of the infrared. Everyone at Spitzer wishes that Hubble might one day be the Spitzer of the optical. That's never going to happen. Um, the submillimeter is still struggling to have something that's competitive, although Alma and Herschel are coming. So, you know. This is just to show that astronomers now have a wide variety of, of tools in the toolbox that are useful to detect different kinds of light, to look at different kinds of astronomical objects. The corollary to this is that astronomy's gotten very expensive. In 1609, the best telescope in the world was made by Galileo, and you bought one, and there you were. Now you need one in each column, right? And astronomy is continually improving. We're wanting more and more telescopes in each of these columns. And we're all at the stage where we're trying to figure out, as astronomers, what do we want to build in the next decade? Which of all these columns is the most important thing to fill in these this right question marks? And we haven't decided yet. Um, all right, so how slides up, please? At least partially up, a little bit more. That's actually good. Um, NASA currently has three working space telescopes. These are called the Great Observatories. This was an idea that we would fill in this box. Um, and so we all know Hubble, right? You guys, you know, everyone knows Hubble. Hubble sees optical, a little UV, a little IR. Now this telescope on the left is what Wendy was talking about. This guy is Spitzer. Um, and it's much smaller. I inflated it a little bit to make it feel better. <laughs> but it's incredibly powerful. 
Um, and it sees infrared light. And in fact, it carries a, I don't want to think about how many tens of million dollar version of that infrared camera that we were playing with earlier. And so this, this thing sees cold things and dust and shrouded things. Hubble sees things that are about as hot as the sun or hotter or colder. And then Chandra is this X-ray observatory that sees the very hot universe um, and things like the gas in clusters of galaxies so hot that it glows in the X-rays. Now, one thing you probably, everyone is familiar because it's on you know, Sky and Telescope, it's on uh, US News and World Report, Time. Everyone has seen Hubble photos. They're part of our lives now. Um, they're beautiful. And what's cool is you can go on the web and study them at your leisure and zoom in and um, really explore them at a way that's as high quality as the data astronomers. These other telescopes also have really nice websites, so your homework for tonight, um, it's optional. But if you feel like it, all three of these observatories, Spitzer, Chandra, and Hubble, have beautiful archives that you can go and look at their galleries and see the most fabulous images that each has produced of the cold universe, the very hot, and the middle, the tepid. Now, since this is an interesting time, it's May 4th, this guy is going to basically have a really, it's going to run out of cryogen, and it's going to heat up and be way less useful than it used to be. Uh, it's going to lose two of its three instruments, and this is all known. You could only pack so much coolant on board. The thermos bottle was only so full. And so this poor thing is going to, long, about a week from now, plus or minus a week, um, it's going to mostly die, and then there's going to be one instrument that'll still work just as well, and that's the instrument that Wendy was talking about that we're going to be up to our eyeballs and data from. Um, Hubble, as you may know, is scheduled for a servicing mission uh, by the astronauts that is supposed to launch a week from today on May 11th. Hubble right now, if it's a five-speed transmission, Hubble's somewhere stuck between first and second. Uh, most of its key instruments have failed, and so the astronauts are going to go try and repair it. And first of all, give it another, uh, another UV telescope, a, a, a new UV instrument, which it's lacked and really needs. Um, it's going to fix the other UV instrument, so, you, so Hubble again will be a UV telescope. And it's going to give it a fantastic new camera in the optical and the infrared. And so one of the things the servicing mission is going to do is make Hubble, it's like a brand new Hubble. It's going to also give it much better infrared and UV, much more multi-wavelength coverage. So um, you know, that'll be something to watch next week and we all hope that it goes well. Now, most people don't know it, but there's actually a whole zoo of space telescopes. Everyone can name Hubble, but all of these guys, except this one, which rests in peace, but was a great observatory, um, all of these guys are up and working. Um, and so, you know, we're not as familiar with them, but they're all returning data. And most of these see colors of light that never reach the ground. Uh, UV telescope never reaches the ground. X-ray, ditto. Gamma ray, double ditto. X-ray, X-ray. Microwave, you just want things to be very sensitive and, and, um, and uh, cold. So you need that. Kepler, very stable, looking for planets. Uh, gamma ray, gotta go to space. And, X and XMM, X-rays, gotta go to space. So much of the need for putting, you know, costs $100 million at least to put um, a satellite, an astronomical satellite, in orbit. And the reason for doing so is that most of these wouldn't do anything on the ground because the atmosphere is in the way. So that was light. And I told you I would give you time on black holes. But we needed that introduction to understand what I'm going to show you. Okay, so it's not all black holes all the time, but it's okay. So what is a black hole? This is a decent definition. Well, I don't think Webster's uses the word smushed. <laughs> But a black hole is a concentration of matter that is smooshed together so tightly that nothing, not even light, can escape its gravity once the light gets close enough. There are black holes in the universe right now that you and I are in no danger of being sucked into. They're far away. Gra you know, the, the, light from, the gravity from a black hole cares about how far away you are. But once you get close enough, very close to a black hole, then you reach a point and you wouldn't even know it because it's not like there's a line or anything. It's like crossing the equator. When you know, you've approached the black hole and you kind of have second thoughts and you pull back. And you approach the black hole again and you get second thoughts. But there comes a point when you get close enough that you try to escape and you find that your, you know, your enterprise's warp engines are not powerful enough. 
And moreover, you take your laser pointer behind you and you start beaming a light you know, out of the black hole, an SOS message. And what you see as you beam your flashlight or your laser pointer up, signaling for help, is that those photons bend back around like a fountain and come back down. And that's when you know you're in trouble. <laughs> so that's really when we say that not even light can escape once you get close enough. If this, you know, if this, if this laser pointer starts going back down, we're in trouble. So that's a black hole. That said, if you're outside that radius, that distance, that point of no return, you're okay. And if you're way far away from it, we are um, 24,000 light years from the black hole at the center of our galaxy, we're fine. Can't eat us, we're far away. So, all right, so that's black holes. Now, I said that nothing, not even light, can escape a black hole. Black holes are black. So how come the introduction of my talk was about seeing black holes? I must be a crazy person. Well, you can't see the black hole, but you can see stuff around it. In fact, the stuff around it, it's really, really bright and easy to see. And let me show you why that is. Think about something falling downhill. Well, downhill is just the direction where the thing with the gravity is, right? That's essentially what downhill is. So as you fall toward a black hole, you are falling toward the, the biggest and steepest downhill in the universe, right? And by the time you get close, you are really moving. You think, this guy has problems. You're moving at something like the speed of light. You can't reach the speed of light because you have mass, but you can get to a good fraction of it. And so you are falling toward the black hole in the biggest downhill in the universe, converting the gravitational energy of the black hole um, into, your kinetic, into your energy of motion. All right, so you're moving at a good clip and you slam into another skier who is also falling into the black hole on a different path. You're both, each of you is moving at something, you know, a fraction of the speed of light and you slam into each other. At that point, your energy of motion and you are really moving gets converted into heat. And what do we know about hot things? They glow. And these things get so hot, they glow in the UV, they glow in the X-ray, they glow in the optical. And so it is absolutely true that a black hole can't glow, and a black hole is black, Hawking radiation accepted. But the matter falling toward it, and falling around it, and slamming into each other, gets really hot, and it glows like crazy. And so what you get, actually, is a whole bunch of skiers, all right, let's drop that analogy, a whole bunch of things, gas is falling down into the black hole, and it has some net spin, and so what you set up is a disk of matter that's all falling in, and the particles are spiraling inward and downward, and they rub against each other, and that makes fr that's friction, that makes heat, that emits light, that loses energy, it starts spiraling, spiraling in even more. And so something that starts on the outside goes around and around and slowly loses energy until, and it doesn't even realize it, it goes past the point of no return. It sends the little flashlight message out, it bounces back, and you're in trouble. All right? Now, so yes, the center, the black hole itself is black, but the stuff falling into it is glowing. As material falls into a black hole, it can lose between 6% uh, and 40% of its rest mass energy, depending on whether the black hole spins or not. That's a good question to ask. Questions. Now let me tell you what that means, losing uh, 6 to 40% of your rest mass energy. So, we all know E equals mc squared. It's the most famous equation in the world, and we never get to use it, so let's use it tonight. Let's take a more lighter weight person in the audience, about 50 grams, uh, 50 kilograms, 120 pounds. Multiply by the speed of light squared, and we get 4 times 10 to the 18 joules. Well, what does that mean? That's 1,000 megatons. The biggest bomb I learned on Wikipedia ever exploded was about 50 megatons. So this is 20 times, so converting my rest mass, I'm just sitting here, but if we took all the energy that's bound up in you know, the atoms that I have, we could get 20 times more energy than uh, the biggest nuclear bomb ever detonated. Now a black hole can liberate, liberate about six to, uh, to 40% of that. So that's a really efficient process. You can extract almost half the rest mass out of stuff as it spirals in. So as stuff spiraling into this thing, it's losing a lot of its energy. 
And the only thing more efficient than this process is matter-antimatter annihilation. This is how the engines work on Star Trek. Except there's almost no antimatter left in the universe, so it's hard to go find an antimatter's worth of yourself and walk into it and blow up. And nuclear fusion, which is far more efficient than any energy source we have on Earth, and we wish we could learn how to do it because then we would solve our energy problems. Nuclear fusion converts less than 1% of the rest mass of those hydrogen atoms into energy. So a black hole is 80 times more efficient. And so even though black holes are very rare in the universe, the light from stuff spiraling down into them is an appreciable fraction. Uh, it competes reasonably well. It's probably a little bit less, but we don't yet really know, with all the light emitted by stars. So even though black holes are rare, they really matter as we look into the universe. A lot of the light that we see that is ionizing gas, that is um, being detected by our telescopes, is coming from stuff spiraling into black holes. Now, if black holes are turned on, if they have that accretion disk, if they're swallowing stuff as they spiral in, by the way, this is called an accretion disk, okay, because it's stuff accreting and being swallowed. If black holes have one of those, they're feeding, they have a source of, of fuel, then, then we can see them most of the way across the universe. They can be very bright. Here's an example. This is a galaxy that has a black hole in its center that's turned on, and that accretion disk is outshining the whole rest of the galaxy. Had to take a very a deep Hubble image to see that there even was a galaxy. When these quasars were originally discovered, people wondered whether they were just out in space by themselves. You have to take very good images and black out the brilliant light of the quasar to see the galaxy. Which already tells you right there that that black hole um, is liberating an enormous amount of energy. But usually black holes are turned off. They're not feeding. They don't have an accretion disk. For example, the Milky Way's black hole, which is about 2 million solar masses, but it's off. It's actually very hard to see. We can see stars whizzing around it. They're being pulled by an unseen mass, and so we know how big it is. But it's turned off. Most black holes are turned off, and it would be a great question to ask why is that we don't actually know what turns a black hole on and off. We have some theories, but that's a big outstanding question in astronomy. Black holes are actually, so black holes make a lot of light, so we care about it. Okay. Black holes are also intimately connected, we have learned, with the, excuse me, with the history of galaxy formation. And we don't exactly understand why. We know that every galaxy keeps a giant black hole in its center. And what we've learned recently in the last 20 years is that big galaxies like this one, this whole thing is this galaxy, have big black holes, and that small galaxies have small black holes. Okay? So here is a big one, a 2 billion solar mass black hole, the mass of 2 billion suns packed into that. Here's a little one, little one 2 million solar masses, about the size of ours. So what we see is the galaxy, and I'm just telling you there's a black hole in there that's that massive. All right, so this kind of makes sense. Big, it seems fair that big galaxies should have big black holes and little galaxies should have little black holes, right? It's kind of sharing. We have no idea why this happens. This is one of the this is another fundamental outstanding question in astronomy. Because that whole accretion dust that we were just looking that we were looking at a artist conception of is not very big. Even around the biggest black holes that we've found, when they're turned on, that disk of matter spiraling in is only about the size of our solar system. Now our solar system is kind of big, but it's nothing near as big as a galaxy. And so how does the black hole know about the galaxy, which is a billion times bigger than it. How does it know, oh, I live in a big galaxy. I should eat a lot and grow big. And how does the galaxy, which is way out there, tell the black hole how big it's supposed to be? We don't really have an answer for this, and it's troubling. The universe knows how to do this, and we don't yet. So this is something that a lot of astronomical research in the, next, um, in the foreseeable future is focused on trying to answer. We also don't know. It's sort of a chicken and an egg problem, which grew first. Did the black holes form, and then the galaxy said, oh, a big black hole, I'll become big. You know, or do they grow at the same time? We don't know that either. Another problem, which Wendy alluded to in her introduction, is that many black holes in the local universe appear to be hidden, and they're hard to find. The universe had a very sooty and messy past. 
It generated a lot of dust, a lot of soot, a lot of smoke. And those are all things, if you remember the days when they were still smoking in restaurants, made it really hard to see. Visible photons don't get through. And so it's possible that there are a lot of black holes that are missing because they have been hidden by large amounts of dust and gas. And this is something that I am very interested in. Um, we'd like to know where they are. Um, and let me just back up for one second. Um, let's see. Yeah. Oh well. So I do want to say, um, without a slide to show it, but we'll make one up. It's worth pointing out that people always ask me in restaurants or on the gold line, do we know that black holes exist? And the answer is that the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which was a survey of about half a quarter of the sky, found 130,000 big black holes in the centers of galaxies that are turned on. Okay, they make a very characteristic signature called a quasar. And so the answer, do we know that black holes exist, is yes, we know of at least 130,000 of them. So what I'm trying to do is find the ones that are missing from those catalogs because they're really obscure. Let me show you what I think are some of them, and we're trying to prove whether or not they are. So this is a piece of blank sky. Blank, there aren't any bright galaxies in the way. It's about the size of your pinky finger, uh, pinky finger nail held out. And so this is taken in the mid-infrared with the IRAC camera on board Spitzer. And so this isn't very pretty. None of what I'm going to show you now is very pretty, which is why I told you to go to those beautiful galleries of, of Hubble and Spitzer. But this is what we actually do for a living. A lot of us who try to look at distant galaxies look at little dots, which is kind of not pretty to take home and show their relatives until you try to convince them that this is the light of 10,000 galaxies in this one image. Every dot you see other than these really bright ones, which are stars, Almost every dot in this image is a galaxy like ours. See? I like showing little dots. So this is actually a science image. People do, and what I'm going to show you right now is, it is less technical, but it's the thought process that we went through in trying to find some of these hidden black holes. So not as pretty, but 10,000 galaxies right here, each with billions of stars in them. And you thought that image was, was ugly. This one's really ugly. This is in the mid to far infrared. So even redder than our little digital, than our infrared camera we were using. And so in here, what we see in this light, this is actually the light of stars, it's the light of the redder stars. This isn't starlight at all, it's too cool. It's actually seeing things that are too cool to be stars. And what most of that is probably is, we're almost certain, uh, is dust that's been heated by stars. If you take a star and you hide it behind a lot of dust, you'll heat that dust up, kind of, it'll be warm, and then you can detect it in these mid-infrared cameras. So this is heated up by, by, but the dust doesn't care what heated it. A black hole, the accretion disk around a black hole could heat it up, or stars could heat it up. So either way, something heated up the dust in these galaxies to make this image. So the stars, the stellar light of 10,000 galaxies, and then those that are lighting up like Christmas trees because they have lots of hot dust. Now, that's too big an image, so let's zoom in. First, I'll show you, this is the x-ray picture. It's hard to make x-rays, and only really, really hot things make x-rays, like the hottest region of that accretion disk around the black hole. So with a few exceptions, everything in here is a hot accretion disk around a black hole, every little dot, which is kind of cool, because you can take that previous image and say, which ones have the black holes that are turned on? Those. Not pretty, but you know, these are, there's no other way we can think of to make this much X-ray light coming out of these galaxies. It pretty much has to be stuff falling into the black hole. Now we're gonna zoom in on this little part, and it gets really ugly, right? So see that constellation, right? Really ugly. X-ray astronomy is not as pretty as Hubble. But these are the hot coroni, these, you know, fine, they're black holes. It's worth being ugly because it's cool. This is the same box that in the infrared, and you see that we detect far more things because we're getting both the black holes. Keep your eye on some of these guys, right? You can see them in the infrared as well, like this one, say, right? Um, they're blowing in both the infrared and the x-ray. 
And so what we did in this project, and this was uh, Jennifer Donnelly's thesis project at the University of Arizona, and I helped, but she did most of the work here. So I'm just promoting her science. Um, what she said is, okay, you know these, these things that are bright in the x-ray, so I think they have black holes in them. Many of them have really weird colors in the infrared. They don't look like stars at all. They don't look like galaxies at all. And so what she did is she very carefully quantified what weird color meant and then said, what else in this image has the same really weird colors? And what she found were these yellow circles, which are, we think, we don't really, we're trying to figure out what they are, but what we think they are, they don't have x-ray detections, but they have those same weird colors. And our best guess is that they are also accreting black holes, feeding black holes, that are hidden behind large amounts of dust so that not even the x-rays got through. And then that dust has been heated and it's glowing with a weird color and we're seeing it in the infrared. So this is something we're working on. The problem is that these things are all very, very faint in the optical. It's hard to prove whether we're right or wrong. We're looking forward to a new generation of infrared spectrographs that are coming to Magellan because then we can see these things where they're bright and try to understand what's going on with them. There are also other ways to get at this question. You can build x-ray telescopes that can see through even a lot of dust. That would be a great question to ask me about because one of those telescopes is being built at Caltech. It's called New Star, and it'll hopefully launch in two years. And it looks at really high energy x-rays, like um, medical x-rays. When you get, when you break a leg and they take an x-ray of you, um, astronomers aren't yet able to study the universe in those energies, but we'd like to be able to, because if they can go through your body, they can go through most of the universe. So one last example. This is what Wendy alluded to about using gravitational lenses, using the universe as a telescope. And this is totally being greedy, because this is deciding that Magellan and Spitzer and Hubble and all the rest of it aren't enough. So what you want is the biggest telescope in the universe, and that's the biggest concentration of mass in the universe. Mass bends light. That was part of Einstein's theory. And so if you take something like this, which is a famous cluster of galaxies, everything white in here in this color scheme, is a galaxy in a cluster. This is the largest gravitation, one of the largest gravitationally bound things in the universe. This bends light. And so what you see, these arcs, see those spread out? Those are actually images of background galaxies that have been warped and distorted like a funhouse mirror. And it's not important that they're warped. What's important is that they got brighter, they got amplified by the lens, and so you can see them. And so what I've been doing is, is uh, with Magellan and with Spitzer and with Hubble and with Chandra has been going after these things because they let you look at galaxies that are 30 times brighter than they have any right to be. It's not that it's a special galaxy, it's just behind this natural telescope. So this is a three color image from Hubble and already you can pick out by the colors, these things are the cluster, red, these things are part of the cluster and then these blue things, see these? Blue or red things are behind the cluster and they're arcs. Then let's look at the infrared. Poor infrared, it's just not as pretty yet. But we can pan, you see the blue things here in the cluster. But look at this guy, the tiny little arc. This is one of my favorite galaxies. This is a tiny little arc in the optical, you can barely see it. But in the infrared, it's this big bright thing. We're seeing this thing as it looked 11 billion years ago. The light in it, it's at redshift 2.5 for the nerds in the audience. So the light in it has been traveling, that we're seeing now, the light we see now has been traveling for 11 billion years. And the universe is only 13.7 billion years old. So we're seeing this galaxy back when it was young, we're getting to see what a big galaxy looked like back in its youth. We'd like to know how our Milky Way assembled. Maybe this is something like that, or maybe this is more massive galaxy. Now, you thought this was ugly? I got ugly. You ready? Watch this guy. This is what it looks like at 24 microns. This is even longer wavelength than this little camera. This is really ugly. But what's happening is that the cluster is going away because it doesn't have many galaxies with hot dust. And all that's showing up are the galaxies that are chock full of dust that's been heated by something, by star formation in this case, we think. And so what we can tell from this kind of ugly, humble image is that this galaxy right here is forming about 170 solar masses of stars every year, 170 suns a year. 
our galaxy is forming one. So this galaxy is really building up its, uh, itself. And when we look at this thing, our clock, my clock writers and I have figured out that this thing has been doing this for probably about 30 to 100 million years. It can do it. It has enough gas left over to keep going for about 30, and then the gas meter goes off. And what that means, if you say, all right, if it keeps going like it is now, how many stars can it form? It can form about a quarter to a half of the number of stars that are in our galaxy. <coughs> so we think that ugly images like this, and they'll get much more beautiful, that's what the James Webb Space Telescope is for, are showing us that in this, so this is an average galaxy back in the day that we think is building up all of its stars pretty quickly. I mean, 100 million years is a long time, but it's short compared to the age of the universe. And so we think, and you can only really figure this out by using the optical with Hubble, the infrared with Spitzer, and then even more infrared with Spitzer to figure this out. So one of the things I'm interested in, and one of the things that many astronomers are working on, is using these sorts of tricks to try to understand how galaxies like ours build up their stars. All right, so things to take away, and I hope Please let it not be that with a hair dryer you can draw pictures on a board. Okay? This is the science to take away. If you want to know the universe, you got to know about light. Astronomers spend most of our time thinking about light. What kind of light do I need to detect to answer this question? What kind of instrument do I need to build or do I need to use to detect the kind of light that I need to, right? We're obsessed with light because light is how we understand the universe. There are many things in our, in our daily life that seem very disconnected. I need to get an x-ray, I have a, um, a night vision camera, I got sunburned at the park, that are all the same thing, it's all light. And to astronomers, we're willing to use whatever we can get. Hopefully you will remember that you glow, that everything with a temperature glows, and that we all glow in the infrared, which is why night vision goggles work. Um, you know, we need everything we can get, and a black hole lurks in the heart, as near as we can tell. A black hole lurks in the heart of every galaxy. And what many of us are trying to do is figure out what, you know, how did that happen, and how did that come to be, how did that evolve? And it is now possible, albeit really hard, to find cases where we can see galaxies forming, building up a Milky Way's worth of stars in a short amount of time. And we're trying to understand better how and why that happened and what turned it on and what turns it off. But we're getting to see how you build galaxies back when they formed. So thank you all for coming. Thank you all for coming to this whole series. I've enjoyed it. I hope you have. And I hope you have a lot of questions about light and black holes and young stars and whatever. So please ask. for that very creative talk and demonstration. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like that. I'm sure we have questions for Jane. Ah, the question is, what's my best guess as to what's inside a black hole? How many of you have been to a talk by Stephen Hawking over at Caltech? A couple, yeah, you know? So that's a question for Stephen Hawking. <laughs> no, I, mean, I mean, astronomers, most astronomers are very pragmatic people. We get a bunch of tools in the toolbox and we say, I got a hammer, a needle nose pliers, and a wrench. I'm good to go. An astronomical black hole, that's actually the term, there's only one kind of black hole, but to an astronomer, a black hole is a bunch of mass in one place that something goes wrong that we don't understand about physics after that point because we really don't have the physics yet to describe it but that happens to be so massive that stuff gets really hot as it falls in so we can study it. But I'm being a little trivial, but the point is very true that we do not yet have a physics, we don't yet have a theory of gravity that is able to describe what happens inside a black hole. It breaks down. And the reason is that this, black holes are a place where quantum mechanics and general relativity collide. And general relativity and quantum mechanics are mutually incompatible theories. Right? General relativity says that matter bends space, and that, matter, that space distorts and warps. Quantum mechanics says that space sits still, and stuff happens inside of it. 
right? Experiments happen. And you know, general relativity is it's predictive, it's on big scales. There's no uncertainty. Quantum mechanics is all about probabilities and uncertainty. The problem is that a black hole is at the size where quantum mechanics matters and at the mass where general relativity matters. And we don't yet have a theory that connects them. Um, there are a lot of very bright people like Stephen Hawking who work on that. And they don't know either. So the answer, the honest to goodness answer is that nobody really knows. I know, I, you know I, we're all curious, but to be honest, astronomers have no real expertise in this area. We read and try to understand what Stephen Hawking is telling us like everyone else, the higher level still. Um, but there is not yet a theory of gravity to answer your question. Great question. The question is, do we know yet what causes gamma ray bursts? The answer is yes. There was, I'm going to draw an ugly, I'm going to go back a little bit to uh, the top middle guy called SWIFT has been a really wonderful telescope because what it does, it's actually a perfect um, illustration of the need to use all the colors of light. SWIFT sees a quarter of the sky in the gamma rays, in the hard x-rays, and it, when it detects a gamma ray burst, a flare of light, in the gamma rays, these bursts go off about once a day that are brighter than the whole rest of the sky, and then they go off. It sees it and figures about roughly where it happened, and then there's an afterglow in the x-rays that hangs around for a couple minutes. And so it has an x-ray telescope that slews over and says, okay, how bright was it? Oh, it's there. And then it has an optical telescope that says, oh, it was exactly there. And then it sends an email to everyone on the ground saying there was a burst and it was right here. The answer is, so that's been the technology, and it's a multi-wave technology, to let us figure that question out. God, let us hope not. Um, so the answer is, so that's, a long, so that's how we know. What we know is that they appear to be some kinds of stars blowing up. Some kinds of stars, when they blow up, make these gamma ray flares, these gamma ray bursts. They're converting a lot of their energy into gamma rays. Now, we don't know why, but it's, it, we're not, it doesn't seem to be all stars that are blowing up. So why is it some stars and not others? We don't really know, and that's what theorists have fights about at conferences. But we do know now that gamma ray bursts are stars blowing up, so that's progress. about string theory. And this is another case where I say that, first of all, we don't know string theory is right. String theory is one possible answer to the question two rows behind you, three rows behind you, which is how do you how do we unify general relativity and quantum mechanics? Okay? We don't know that string theory is the right answer. It sounds cool because it's pluckable and it seems nice. The answer to your question is I do, I'm not an expert on string theory and I do not know the answer to your question. So I'll duck it. So the best gamma ray telescope on Earth is actually a large block, or it's actually in space because they don't work in Earth, um, is a large block of salt, really. So we have a gel and it's beautiful, it's elegant, the light bounces off and it goes up the primary and it goes to the secondary and it goes in our instruments, and this is great. In the gamma rays, you take a large block of salt, you wait for a gamma ray to go through it, and then you look at all the little particles that came off the salt and you try to figure out which way it went and from that you figure out what direction it came from. It's really hard. It's not really a telescope. It's like a giant salt lick. And, <laughs> you know, the Fermi up here is the best so far, upper right-hand corner. Uh, and it is still really difficult. Fermi has actually been finding lots of gamma ray emitting sources. Uh, yes, it finds magnetars, it sees pulsars, it sees blazars, which are uh, creating black holes. This 
is great. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. So the answer is yes. We have we are now detecting gamma rays decently. Um, I was wondering about the weird color um, image. Uh, mm -hmm. With the black holes that produce those, these supermassive black holes and quasars, or would they be near, relatively nearby? This is an excellent question. One of, the, one of the things I did not have time to talk about, and taking a cue from George, I made a list of stump the speaker questions. And one of these is number five. Aren't there a lot of black holes in every galaxy? I've talked about black holes as if there's just one per galaxy. Because in most, in every galaxy we can test, there is one that's a million solar masses, 10 million, 100 million, billion solar masses. One in the center that's really big. There are also a lot of black holes that are small that are just about a solar mass or so because they're what happened when a supernova, one supernova blew up, okay? When we look at our galaxy, we see that there's one black hole in the center, two million solar masses turned off, and then about a hundred little guys, one about the mass of the sun, that are in the disk. I have totally avoided that subject it, in this talk because it didn't fit, but it is really interesting. We know that when we look at, the answer to your question, of these guys um, in the x-rays, is that these are coming from other galaxies, because at the position of each of those x-ray things, we can go look and there's a galaxy there. And it's not in our galaxy and it's far away and it's really bright, so it needs to be a black hole. But other people, so when I do black holes, I do you know, million solar mass things in the center of galaxies. Other people do black holes that are the remnants of, of stellar explosions and they're about a solar mass. You can ask the question, how did the one, how do you get big solar black holes? Um, how do you get the million solar mass ones? And that's down. Um, Yes, how do you make them? And nobody knows the answer, and that's one of the stump speaker questions. I know. George says it's Cygnus X1. Now, um, there are, when, you know I mentioned that the first X-ray telescopes were launched on these old sounding rockets and you got four minutes of data and then they fell back to Earth? In those four minutes of data, they saw that there were a couple of X-ray sources that were ridiculously bright. So bright that modern detectors like Chandra can't look at them because it would burn them out. Those guys, we think, are these one solar mass or so black holes left over from a supernova that there's a companion going around and dumping mass onto. And so it has a little accretion disk, and that's bright. So there are several that are about 1,000 to 5,000 light years away, and they tend to have names like Cygnus X1, because it's the brightest X-ray source in Cygnus, um, and SCO X1, and I'm not sure which one is the closest, but there are a bunch. And can black holes move? That's an excellent question. Sure. So the question is, can black holes move? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Actually, a, a more, um, what, one thing that people have recently seen in action, when two galaxies collide, every galaxy has a black hole. So when they collide, those black holes need to merge at some point. And so they gotta, they'll be spinning around each other and then falling and stuff like that. And future space missions would like to detect the gravitational waves that that gives off. So absolutely, they can move. Um, so before we thank our speaker one more time, let me just remind you that there are these lectures coming up um, at Griffith, the Griffith Observatory. I know one of the speakers very well, and she'd be delighted to see you if you could come. <laughs> so let's thank tonight's speaker. In fact, all the speakers.